Welcome to the Riot Podcast, where we have practical discussions on how to share your faith, see the news from God's eyes, and answer some of faith's hardest questions. Welcome to the Riot Podcast. This is Bob Shoneman alongside Mac Daddy Pete Robertson. Hello. Nice shirt, Pete. I, know, I, like, I like the it. color. Yeah, you know That's how I like it. Really nice. It's two sizes too big. That's all right. You didn't have to mention that. Nobody's gonna nobody can hear that on the podcast. I, you know why I did it? Because we do we are on YouTube. A lot of people don't know that, but we're on YouTube. And sometimes I wear like black or my logo shirt a lot. You know, sometimes, most of the times. Yeah, most of the time. Most of the time. Yeah. So I thought, hey, I'm gonna do a color this morning. So I do this canary color or whatever this color is. But Salmon. It's salmon. Anyway, great story. I got to introduce our other guest. <laughs> we also are honored to have the third part of our tricord here today. Pastor Barry Rice is hey, in everybody. that body. It's so good to be with you guys. And I am not wearing salmon. <laughs> uh, I've been freezing to do that. Yes, I have a rebellious nature, uh, but I'm a blue guy. Uh, I just got to say it. So, yeah. Carolina he's, blue? Yeah, he's wearing like his awesome Under Armour shirt. It is. He's looking sharp. Yeah. Sharp. Well, you know, something funny happened this weekend, Barry. I, I was watching, the three of us went and saw Jesus Revolution. I don't know when it first came out. Yeah, we three, had four months ago. I don't know. It's been yeah, a while. That was nice. Stop. Okay. And then, yeah, we go to the movies together, but I make uh, Bob <laughs> buy the popcorn. Right. Yeah, I think he did. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thanks, Bob. But anyway, my 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 girls hadn't seen the movie yet, so we're it was a, a Friday last Friday night, I think, and uh, we're just watching the movie. And uh, I reached out. I don't for some reason one of the one of the one liners in there made me think of Pete. So I reached out to Pete. Say, hey, guess what? I'm finally getting to show my girls the movie, and he sends me a picture back of him watching the TV, watching the same movie. That's just so weird. Isn't it, it was. So we went over to a friend's house, and um, as we're hanging out with them, we just said, hey, let's just watch it. You know, let's watch these. Had they not seen it yet? Um, I think they might have seen it in the theater as well, but they forgot. But anyways, I, I was real emotional at that time because I was I when I'm watching the movie, I any one liners, I will text them myself or I'll write them down yeah. because I just love yeah. to keep them. And um, I was doing that. And then you texted me and I showed Christine. I was like, look at this. <laughs> That's so weird. And, and it was just like it was strange. And so I just took the picture and I sent it back to you. <laughs> and uh, I was just like, wow. But man, yeah, God really moves in that. That, what what is your favorite one liner or just if you can't remember verbatim you know particular yeah. scene of the movie do you have do you have one that really stands out uh, there's and a, same for you Barry there's a couple um I know the one time where uh Chuck was doubting himself um and his wife encouraged him and says you you know I put it up on my Facebook I think it's something like you're too arrogant to you know think that God can't use you through your failure yeah um, or how arrogant is it to think yeah, God yeah, can't yeah, use yeah, you? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's yeah. a great line. I mean, there's a few. I don't know if you remember any of them. Do you do? Yeah, the the one that stood out to me totally was that he he got away from his religion and he accepted another brother that loved Jesus. Mm. If we can, even even if we look different, we walk different, we act different, but you love Jesus, there can be fellowship and there can be partnership and. Uh, I, that that really stood out to me in a movie. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the reason why I was not watching the movie on Friday night, because I am a football guy and I was at a high school football game on Friday night. So these guys were sitting at home doing nothing, but just trying to figure out what's on TV. I am uh, out there cheering on young men oh, as they represent their communities. I love it. But yeah, it, that took a that took a turn on us. They asked me that my friends, they asked me, what would this be a, a associated with today? Um, you know, how would how could we relate to that to our world today, our culture today? What would that look like? Because back then, you know, the hippie movement was going and the church, part of the scenes at the church, I got something in my eye, part of the scenes at the church was they were saying that they needed to change first before they can come to the church. Mm. And Chuck was saying, no, no, they're gonna come as they are. Right. They're just yeah. we're not going to have them change. They're still doing drugs. They're still doing sex. They're still doing all the things they shouldn't be doing. But he was going to love them where they were. And then not only that, what changed, what really set it off is where he allowed them to do worship. He allowed them to write their own worship songs. Love song was the name of them. And they just started because they were doing it from a genuine, pure heart. And in the story theme was they were looking for love, just all the wrong places. Right. They were looking for all of that. They just couldn't found it. And part of that, the church scene was Chuck says, you know, this home, this is your home. We want to, well, let's serve the Lord together, right? And let's work through the differences. Let's work through that. So I'll ask you guys this question. What would be 
what would our culture today look like if we opened the door as a church to what community or what what people? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind, Pete, is, you know, Jesus over and over and over went outside the walls of the church to love people. And, uh, you know, uh, I think even in the beginning of the movie is that they were so many of the congregants were were stuck in their religious activities and they had a set way to dress. They had a set style of worship. They had yeah. a set. Yeah. Everything was set and uh, God wanted to do something new. And, you know, God does new things. He doesn't change the message, but he does new things to get us out of our comfort zone. And, and uh, the church getting outside the walls of the church and loving on people and meeting people right where they're at. Um, it's, it's gotta be something that we do. Bob, yeah. Guys... I, kind of along the same lines. And, and this hit me honestly, Sunday morning, driving, driving to church yeah. with air quotes, church, um, and driving to church and there's these ball fields. There's, there's one group, one side of the ball field. There's like 2000 people at a paintball. They're like just going and doing paintball Sunday morning. And then you get to the ball fields where the football fields and the baseball fields. And there's another probably two, 3000 kids. I mean, at eight o'clock in the morning, they're all there playing soccer and, and football and all these, you know, all these different things. And so I think what Barry is saying is so true. It's like, we can keep hiding in these, in our four walls and hoping they come to us, but that's not working real well. No. Almost like we've got to have a change somehow we got to change and we've got to go to them, you know? And I don't know how that, what that looks like, but man, it just really hit me Sunday morning it, that look at, there's thousands and thousands of people across the street from where we're meeting in a church service. And, uh, that, I mean, they're worshiping something. Yeah. Everybody's worshiping something. Yeah. And, uh, we got to, I think we got to find a new way to reach people. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same it, message. But... Yeah. It's, it's we're, the church for so long is, is all about trying to fix somebody. And, and we, we push our agenda on them. Um, and I, and I think that, you know, what Chuck was doing in this movie was just basically say, Hey, listen, God really sees you for who you are now. And he loves you for who you are now. And in the, in the mindset of the goal was, Hey, I'm going to continue to love you like Christ. And I'm going to teach you the truths of Christ. And then it's the Holy spirit's responsibility to transform you, renew your mind. That's good. And, um, and I think that we look at these labels, the gay communities, the the people that are drug addicts, the people that are whatever, and we have these labels that we say, hey, you're this, you have to change, you have to repent, you have to do this. And what Jesus is saying, no, is, I love you. And, um, you know, and I'm going to continue to love you. And I'm never going to stop loving you. It's, you, you. Now, you can either accept my love or not. And, and um, many of them are going to, you know, run from his love and reject his love. We're going to talk about that on the show. It's like, you know, our job is to love. Our job is to pursue. Our job, like you just said, meet them where they're at and just be the, be, be, I just want us to be. So, Did, does Jesus love you more now, Pete, than before you gave your life to him? That's a great question. And I think people can't, don't understand that. But the answer is he loves us the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And it doesn't matter what we've done. And, and that's the hard part because, again, I was raised, I don't know where you were, Bayer, but there was a lot of legalism, yeah. you know. And um, there's a lot of stone thrown, a lot of rock. And that's that's just the way I was raised. I haven't mentioned this, Pete, but <clears throat> I've been doing something that's really been challenging me. Um, every Sunday morning, the last five weeks, I've been meeting a homeless man. And uh, picking him up, he puts his luggage in the back of my car. I carry him to church and he serves as a homeless man. And uh, he, he has a foul as mouth, you know, but uh, I, I can't get away from Jesus saying, when you've done it unto the least of them, you've done it unto me. And uh, that's what I really appreciated that about that movie. It, it we expect people to do something for us. We expect people to give something to us before we can love them. But that's not what Jesus did. Yeah, what you just said speaks more than anything that I just said. Mm. 
because it it just that's action. That's that is exactly what that looks. Like. And you know, thank you, Barry, for being an example. Awesome. It is awesome. Yeah. Well, Pete, why don't you open us up in prayer, <laughs> and uh, we'll jump into our show today. Uh, I don't want to give too much away, but we're we're getting close to wrapping up the Book of John, and we'll talk about that in just. Lord, again, we are just in all of you and um, Lord, just already just our conversation uh, today about um, what it means to be a, a follower of Christ, what it means to love people um, in a, to just regardless of who they are. Um, and uh, Lord, thank you for the testimony of what Barry has been doing for the last five weeks. And Lord, how that just was uh, such a amazing amazing witness lord and and lord i know there's imperfections and barry's still working out lord all what that means but the bottom line is that jesus you love them yeah. you love this homeless man you love people that are in our communities and uh, lord you desire for us to 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 be the church be an example lord to be a light mm -hmm. and um lord to to remove all of our the rocks that we throw or to remove all of these uh, preconceived ideas that we have, <clears throat> Lord, I I battle the ju judging others so much, uh, Lord, just confessing that there's times I've I'm sitting in other churches and, and I can easily pick point pick out certain things in a church, and Lord, the realization is that there's no perfect church, there's nothing that's out there that's perfect, Lord, and uh, who are we? How arrogant? How prideful could we be to act like we are so much better? Um, Lord, we are saved by grace through mm -hmm. faith. It's not, it's a gift of God. It has nothing to do with our works. It has nothing to do with how good we are. Lord, it has everything to do with how good you are. And Lord, we are just in humble state of mind and just saying thank you and amen. We love you, God. And so we surrender the show to you. We praise you. We honor you. We love you today. We ask that you would use us and speak through us. And Lord, more than anything else, that people would just listen to you, listen to us, Lord, that we fall more in love with you. We love you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pete. Barry, thank you for sharing that. That was awesome. That was, that was powerful. Yeah. Title of today's show is How Do We Find Peace Today? Mm. Or How to Find Peace Today. Yeah. So in a previous show, it, it actually it was show 147. So yeah. go check this out if you didn't get a chance to hear 147. Good. Um, we delved, dove into John 20, uh -oh. specifically verses 1 through 18, where we brought to light the remarkable events surrounding the discovery of the empty tomb. It was the episode filled with it was an episode filled with powerful moments, including Peter and John's urgent run to the tomb. Remember the race? Yeah. We, we talked John, about John that. found out John got there first. That's right. Where they found Jesus's burial linens neatly folded in the tomb. Where also we also discussed Mary Magdalene's profound encounter with the risen Savior as she came face to face with him. If you haven't had a chance, like I said earlier, to listen to that show, jump back and uh, and listen to it. It really leads up to this show really well. Yeah. So, um, this week's episode focuses on the remarkable spread of the news that Jesus was alive among his followers. Initially, there was some hesitation, but as time went on, the enthusiasm grew. I can only imagine. Yep. We will explore how even the disciples themselves had a hard time believing the initial reports and how Thomas demanded tangible proof. Mm. However, every time someone encountered the reality of Jesus's resurrection, their lives were profoundly transformed. Wow. It leads us to reflect <clears throat> on an important question posed by the end of this chapter. Have we personally met the risen Christ? And if so, how has he changed our lives? We'll delve into these thoughts, into these thought-provoking topics and explore the transformative power of encountering yeah i love that statement where um their lives were profoundly transformed it's <clears throat> you know my testimony was i i had uh religion for most of my life and it was not until 2008 that i can i can honestly say that i met the risen christ mm. and and it was i i it was in that moment that i know that i he touched me and i was transformed uh, my eyes, the scales of my eyes were removed. Um, you know, the religion aspect of things was revealed to me. I saw things in a different light. Um, I was broken. I was humble, but I, I realized what it meant to no longer live for my and, and, and this is kind of what we're going to talk about a little bit, this, this transformation, but this is, 
to me, what I'm saying right now, I believe without a shadow of a doubt that everything that the Bible says is true. And, and I can, I'm my testimony, you know, the word of their testimony, right? It's my testimony speaks and says that everything that we're going to read today experience and I could testify. And so, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to see me unbelieving anymore, you know? And so anyway, that's just my two cents to just what that said. That's, it just, it really sparked some passion in me because I can understand that in, if I didn't understand that, I couldn't say it with that passion. I can say that with that reality. I don't thought so. Yeah. Thoroughly convinced. Yeah. Not because you're told, not, not because your parents were Christians, not because you grew up, you grow up in America. People in America mostly say they're Christians because they're American mm. and, and I'm sure other religions and other nations, but here's three men that have done the investigation they they see the evidence about the risen resurrection, the resurrected Lord, and we have made our choice. Mm -hmm. We are we're thoroughly convinced, and we will die. Yeah, on that truth, Amen. because we believe and we are convicted that is only life in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, let's jump into our text today. We're going to start um, again. We're in John twenty, and we're going to start with verses nineteen through twenty five. We're going to read through the ESV. In the ESV, yeah. Thank you. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Go through 25. Okay. Yeah. Now, now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, This is Thomas speaking, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will not believe. Mm. I would never believe. Yeah. I will never believe. Yeah. So Jesus rested in the mm. tomb on the Sabbath and arose from the dead on the first day of the week. Many people sincerely call Sunday the Christian Sabbath, but Sunday is not the Sabbath day. The seventh day of the week, the Sabbath, commemorates God's finished work of the creation. We find this in Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. What Jesus did here commemorates his finished work of redemption, the new creation. God the Father worked for six days, then rested. God the Son suffered on the cross for six hours and then rested. Yeah, I mean, that's extremely powerful insight. You know, God gave the Sabbath to Israel as a special sign that they belonged to him. The nation was to use that day for physical rest. But for Israel, it was not commanded as a special day of assembly and worship. Unfortunately, the scribes and Pharisees added all kinds of restrictions to the Sabbath observance until it became a day of bondage instead of a day of a blessing. Jesus deliberately violated the Sabbath traditions, though he honored the Sabbath day. And so this is kind of leading into um, <clears throat> talking about where we get, why we worship on Sunday. And we're going to talk about it a little bit more, but I think it, you know, let's look at what Jesus was doing. Jesus constantly did things on the sabbath you know to poke chosen chosen says that he you know let's have a little fun let's poke poke the bear a little bit you know in the chosen series he talks about that but it was you know he was basically proving a point you know what you're doing is is all about religion it has nothing to do with the relationship it has nothing to do with you know what i'm asking of you to do and um and so jesus deliberately here you know, is going against kind of, you know, savage, here, savage <laughs> Jesus, right? Here they are, right? Doing something different. I don't know. Any thoughts there to that? Absolutely. Uh, Jesus would always challenge the religiosity of these people. And, and especially when uh, they're doing things to make themselves feel better. I keep the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. And it was always a puffing up of themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when you have, a religious activity kind of like the intro that that belittles other people and that 
uh, if they don't understand it, if they don't do it, you make yourself puffed up and you feel better. That's God's going to always come yeah. after you after yeah. that. Yeah. And that's where our motives comes in. You got to really check your motives. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it can be easy to do that. And I can fall short of that every day. So we have to really check our motives. Why am I doing this? What's the, what's the reason behind what I'm thinking or doing or something? What right. a great reminder. Yeah. All right. Next statement. We know <laughs> There are at least five resurre resurrection appearances of Jesus on the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene in John 20, verses 11 through 18. The other women in Matthew 28, verses 9 and 10. Peter in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 5. The two Emmaus disciples, I said right? Yep, Emmaus, Emmaus disciples in Luke 24, 13 through 32. And the disciples minus Thomas here on uh, in John 20, verses 19 through 25, the text that we just read. Yep. I say all this because it appears that all the believers met together on Sunday evening, which came to be called the Lord's Day. See Revelations 1.10. Revelation 1.10. So this is why the early church met on the first day of the week to worship God and commemorate his death and resurrection, correct? Yeah. So I like that it says um, the Lord's Day. I love that, right? The Lord's Day. Revelation, that's what John gave us there, the Lord's Day. But yes, it does appear this way. The Sabbath was over when Jesus arose from the dead. So the Jewish Sabbath called the Shabbat is from Friday evening until nightfall on Saturday. They still celebrate this. So everything, a lot of things shut down. A lot of the tour stuff stays open, but they all, they still celebrate this. I can't talk to anybody in Israel during this time. They're completely so shut down. Sunset Friday to sunset yep, Saturday. Yep. Yep. It's like, nope. They, I mean, they are strong too. They will not, they will not budge on that. So Jesus arose on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. So the change from the seventh day, Saturday as tradition, to the first day, Sunday, was not affected by some church order. It was brought about from the beginning by the faith and witness of the first believers. For centuries, the Jewish Sabbath had been associated with the law, six days of work, and, when you re and then you rest. But the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, is associated with grace. First, there is faith in the living Christ, then there will be works. Keep in mind, however, there was never any evidence in Scripture that God never that God ever gave the original Sabbath command to the Gentiles, or that it repeated for the church to obey. So this is not saying this is a dogmatic statement that you have to worship on Sunday, uh, but that's just what they started doing. That was just the natural. That's what naturally happened. Okay, we all come together. Jesus revealed Himself right there on Sunday, so they just started worshiping God that day i don't know thoughts I, I think it really connects well with matthew 6 33 seek ye first the kingdom of god here these new believers who are ostracized from their families and their religion and they're seeking this this new way and they're wanting to put christ first in every week and so they come together and they worship together they encourage each, each other and they go out into the week to be a witness yeah, I mean, there's I, there's there's a lot of people that are religious, and I don't want to call out names, but they have to worship on a Saturday, you know, and it's it has to be done this way, or um, you know, they oh, if you're not worshiping on Sunday, then you're not holy or whatever. I mean, it, that's not what this is saying. This is just a tradition. This is something that comes up, and they all met together and they called it the Lord's Day. So if your church is meeting on a Tuesday, and and you're gonna call it the Lord's Day, praise the Lord. You know, it's, there's nothing biblical that's saying he can't. Um, it's, it's just getting together to praise the Lord, to worship the Lord, to, 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 to be broken together and to, and to be in the community so that you can go make a difference in the, in the world around you. So anyway, I, I think we just want to clarify that, but the, I think the reason why we worship a lot of times on Sunday and a lot of people ask, well, how did that come about? Well, here you go. There you go. It's right there. That's how it came about. There's no other way to look at it, you know? So, all right. All right, next next statement. So as as we read this text, we see that the disciples were fearful. How did Jesus transform his disciples' fear into courage? Wow. Um <clears throat> yeah, and it, it it at first when you read it, you know, I'm a little like, okay, why were they fearful? Why I, I mean, just let's just put yourself there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, put yourself there, okay? So let's just not throw stones at them. You know, there's there's radicals. I mean, I'm talking radicals that are just like they're accusing this perfect man to death and anybody that's associated with him. 
So, you know, it's, you know, I remember Elijah, you know, Elijah's doing all these great miracles. And then all of a sudden uh, was a Jezebel, you know, he's like, oh my gosh, I'm sure for my life. And he's running because she's after him, right? It can happen to anybody, you know, and there's a moment of lapse or something, you know, their faith was rocked at this moment. So let's ease up. I just witnessed a mob turn on Jesus. Right. So let's, I mean, so let, I can understand that, but the question here, though, is how did Jesus transform his disciples' fear into courage? That's great, because it did, because we can, as we go through this, we're going to see how that their boldness started to come back. So for one thing, he appeared to them. We do not know where, you know, these 10 frightened men met behind locked doors. We know they were locked. We The Bible tells us they were locked, so they were secure in themselves. They were protecting themselves. Uh, but Jesus came to them without unlocking or opening a door and reassured them. So that to me would have been like, Hey, that was kind of cool. How did you get in here? You know, how did you even know where we were? You know? So, I mean, that kind of might've helped a little bit, but we see here in our past is Jesus resurrected body. He was able to enter the room without opening the door. It was a solid body where he asked them to touch him and to eat. And he even ate some fish with him. We know that from Luke 24, 41 through 43, But it appears it was a different kind of body, one that was not limited by what we call the laws of nature. Another thing he did was say to them, Shalom, peace be with you. His presence brought them peace. This is the message they would carry with them, the gospel of peace. Man had declared war on God, but God declared peace on those who would believe. Mm. I think that was when they're sitting there, when he's saying Shalom, the peace, I think, well, let me just use an old experience. Christine and I, when we were first dating, um, she, for whatever reason, told me that she didn't love me anymore and she loved somebody else. And, and I remember that night I went to this, uh, to my room and I cried. I was devastated. My heart was completely broken. I mean, completely, I mean, thrashed and I was praying to God and, and, um, I felt this I don't know what it was, but I felt this presence, a peace that came on me. And immediately my sorrow and my and my hurting and everything else was completely lifted off. So when I read this, I was thinking when his presence came in there, all of that fear and everything that probably took place was when he said, Shalom, I'm thinking that immediately they probably like, whoa. You know, there was probably something like, oh my gosh. And there was just a calm. And that's my, that's my thought. You know, Thomas didn't get to experience this, but they did. I don't know. Thoughts of that? Yeah. This, this part of the lesson just really rocks me because, you know, when I put my, myself in their shoes, uh, they, here's Peter denying the Lord because he's fearful. And, and Jesus has become their leader, but not only their leader, their best friend. It's someone they looked up to and someone they admired and someone that did incredible miracles in front of them. And they all wanted to be like him, but he was brutally beaten and murdered. Mm. And they they were fearful for their life. Yeah. And, and the presence of Jesus definitely bought that shalom. Mm. But I, I have to insert here that there's definitely something else that trans trans transponded here is that they received the holy spirit in acts 1 8 it says you shall receive power when the holy spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses i believe what was the biggest change here after seeing jesus is definitely seeing jesus and and definitely seeing him in in a living form he's overcome the grave he's overcome death he's alive and definitely he's alive, but they had something different inside of them. They had the Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit is boldness. It is courage. So many times God in the Bible says, take courage for I'm with you. And in inside of us, the presence of the Holy Spirit, when, when I sense that, that power of the Holy Spirit in me, it, it is a, a boldness, but also a humble boldness that I must speak. I cannot be quiet. I must testify and I must witness of what I've experienced and what I've seen and what I've heard. And uh, that, that is how I see that the, the disciples remember he told disciples, unless I go, I cannot send you the comforter, the one yeah. that would give you power. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're going to talk about that in a 
couple points from that when he says he breathes on them. Yeah. So the first part was this was the shalom. This was the first part, the peace part. And then it progressed to that where the Holy Spirit then came upon them. So, you know, as you guys were, you guys are kind of drawing a picture of what's going on in this room, right? This locked room and Jesus just comes in, you know, the picture, uh, the, the story that kind of came to my mind was remember when Jesus is sleeping in the boat and they're going through the storm and he wakes up and he just, he just speaks like peace to the storm. I can't, it's the same to me. I got the same picture as you guys were talking about that room. And I could, that that probably happened to them. They probably realized that. Well, remember that? Oh my gosh. And they just felt that same thing. I don't know. That was just cool. That just popped in my head while you guys were talking about that. I'm trying to picture what's going on in that room. Because like, that's the same thing he did on the lake. Again, at this very moment, it's his physical presence, right? He breathes on the Holy Spirit because he knows that he's going away. Yeah. But at this very moment, it's his physical presence. And it was that peace that he brought so when cool. he says shalom. So yeah. cool. All right. So what you're saying is that Jesus reassured them with his peace. Yeah. But he also reassured them by showing them his wounded hands. He gave them the opportunity to discover firsthand that he indeed was their master and that he was not some phantom or a ghost. Yeah. Interesting side note here. The Gospels do not mention the wounds on Jesus's feet. But we do know that in Psalm 2216 that the messiah's feet were also nailed to the cross yeah a lot of people like i never thought of that a lot of people have argued that and i've actually had this is this stumped me at one point right so i had to do research on my own i looked it up um but yeah so a lot it doesn't say that it didn't say that he had it you know it's not in the gospels it gotta be wrong well it was prophesied (laughs) right there in psalms 22 (laughs) verse 16 You know, so that's how we, again, reading the Bible in context, understand the Bible in context. So, yeah, but that's a great point, Bob. The the wounds meant more than identification. They also were evidence that the price for salvation had been paid and man indeed could have peace with God. The basis for all our peace is found in the person and work of Jesus. He died for us. He arose from the dead in victory, and now he lives for us. If In our fears, we cannot lock him out. He comes to us in grace and reassures us through his word. As Proverbs says, faithful are the wounds Mm. of a friend. So again, look at this. So we might lock him out. We might be fearful in our in our day. We might be trying to avoid any self-protection or whatever that is. But Jesus will enter right in in our presence. And if he if he comes and we open the door to him and we accept him in his work and what he did, we he'll let us feel those hands and those feet. He'll say, hey, look, I am who I am. And that peace of God will come upon you as well. So that's kind of what I'm thinking. When they looked at that, they were like, wait, this is legit, dude. You are. You are who you say you are. You did rise from the grave. You think they called him dude? I don't know. They probably had their slang. I'm serious. They probably had their slang, whatever. Jesus had slang, I'm sure. But I don't know. Thoughts? Yeah, they called him Jeez. They had, was that <laughs> hey, Jeez, Jeez what's up? Man? <laughs> I'm sure of it. He was real, right? There's no JC in him. the house. No? <laughs> he went through the wall. JC in the house. Oh, mercy. All right, let's move on. Right. When Jesus saw that the disciples' fear had not turned to joy, he commissioned them, correct? Well, I mean, remember, you know, it says it twice. Yeah, because I mean, they he was they were he was given the peace or there, but you he can tell based off of what we read, we can sense that okay, there was still more there. They were still a little bit restless. There was still something. So when he said to his father, "Has sent me, even so I now send you." That's he was basically telling him, "Okay, listen, I'm going to give you because you're still thinking, okay, all of this is good." We have the peace. Now what? Okay, now we still are confused here. We're still restless in our heart. It's just still not registering in my brain, right? I get it. I see you. I'm touching you. I'm having some peace, but I'm still like, wait, what? What's this all about? It had to be overwhelming. So I can't even imagine. But so keep in mind that the original disciples were not the only ones present. Others. We we this is we don't want to misread this. Remember, the Emmaus disciples were there as well. The ones that he was walking with, they they were there. They went and ran, remember? So this is not just the original disciples. We're also in the room. This commission was not the formal ordination of a church order. Rather, it was a dedication of his followers to, to the task of world evangelism. We are to take his place in this world. 
What a tremendous privilege and what a great responsibility. It's a humbling to realize that Jesus loves us as the Father loves him and that we are in the Father just as he is in us. It is equally humbling to realize that he has sent us into the world just as the Father sent him. So as he was about to ascend to heaven, he again reminded them of their commission to take the message to the whole world. To not evangelize peace and hope is to not be a Christian. Yet so many people that claim to be Christians do not evangelize. And so this is kind of what Jesus was telling them. So that to give them even more hope or more joy or more peace, he was now telling them, I'm here, I'm doing this, and he's gonna, we're going to lead into the breathing of the Holy Spirit, and he's going to give you the Holy Spirit to not do it on your own. But he's telling them, you now have a purpose. I have gifted each one of you a certain way to go and share this with the world. And there's a reason why we're all different. There's a reason why we have different gifts and skill sets, but we all have the same commission. And that is to go and preach the gospel to every man, every tongue, every nation all over the world. So thoughts, Bear? You know, uh, their, their conversation I could imagine in, in that upper room was, what do we do now? He's dead. Jesus walks through the door and says, no, no, yeah, it's just beginning. Yeah. Now you have the real power. Yeah. You have my authority. Go and make disciples. And, and this is a great commissional verse in the book of John. This is a, a parallel to Matthew 20. Absolutely. Where he says, go and make disciples. Absolutely. He says, as you have heard my, my mission on earth, now it's yours. Yeah gave it away. And he says, now it begins here because you, you have seen me and you must tell everyone that I live. Mm. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if John at that moment remembered back the, you know, the John 17 prayer, you know, when he was talking about, I am the father of one and one as you are one and, um, and they are one with me, you know, and, and I, I, I'm hoping that the light, I think the light, well, I know the light bulb went off. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the same thing with us is once we realize, you know, no, Jesus did this for, for me to save me, but he, he did it so that I would be um, in ministry with him, you know, is, is I go, he goes and, and I go to please the father. I go to bring glory to the father. And as I speak, the Bible says that open your mouth and the, and the spirit of God will fill it as I speak in concert with, you know, the word of God. Um, I'm speaking the words of God to bring life to people. And, and so we're one. And so for them, they're just like, whoa, you know, this is like mind boggling, dude. You know, and they're not even on drugs here. They're just like, their minds are <laughs> blown here. And, and I think it, I mean, it's a little deep to think about what we're talking about, but the reality is, is, is I no longer live. It's Christ that lives within me. It's, you got to understand that. It's like when you've given your life to Jesus, it's, you become one with God and, and, and it's, you, you are no longer living and it's, you know, and it's, it's a, it's amazing thought, you know, and then with the Holy spirit, it's like the Holy spirit's responsibility. We're going to talk about that is, is again, to remind us all things, Jesus. And so the Holy spirit is constantly reminding us of the things of God. And so the Holy spirit knows God's heartbeat and the Holy spirit, if we're in concert with him or in, 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 with him, he is revealing to us all these things. So this is what Jesus, in this little short little time, this is what he's telling them, and this is what they're receiving. And and I'm sure, as we talked about the Holy Spirit, I'm sure the Holy Spirit helped them to understand it. I should, I'm I'm guessing that they probably had a epiphany. It's like oh oh, you know, I'm sure it was one of those exciting moments in their in their thing. They were freaking out, they were scared, and now they're like oh my gosh. You know, they're having one of those, what is it, that Farley guy? What did he, you know, he was yeah, funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he was having one of those things right now. And uh, so that's kind of what happened. I'm I'm sure it would happen to me, I'm thinking, but yeah. All that's right. really good. Let's talk a little more about the Holy Spirit. So right. Jesus came to them and reassured them, but he also enabled them through the Holy Spirit. John 20, 22 reminds us, and this is kind of a parallel with Genesis 2, 7, yep. when God breathed life into the first man. We know that in both Hebrew and in Greek, the word for breath also means spirit, correct? Yeah, so that's a great, so most people don't know that. 
And, and so going into the Greek and to the Hebrew, when you really look at that, the breath aspect is saying spirit. Okay. So what does that mean? You know, why is that a big deal? So the breath of God is the first creation meant physical life and the breath of Jesus and the new creation meant spiritual life. So the believers would receive the baptism of the spirit at Pentecost and be empowered for ministry. We know that in Acts 1 and 2. And apart from the filling of the spirit, they could not go forward to share their faith with others effectively. Now, we've I've done it. I'm sure you've done it. I've done it not in the spirit. I've done it in my flesh. I've I've gone out and repent, you know, and and done some stupid things and said dumb things, not in the right spirit. In order to do it effectively, we must take on the characteristics of God. We must have the gentleness to love the the the, the things that God had. And the only way to do that is we have to rely upon the Holy Spirit. So it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. So the Spirit had dwelt with them in person of Christ, but now the Spirit would be in them. So now they have the empowerment. So in the, when Jesus tells them they can do now greater things, it's because they're no longer doing it in their own power. They're now doing it with a supernatural power, which is the Holy Spirit. And that is one of the benefits of being a follower of Christ. You become supernatural. You no longer are living in a natural realm. You're now living in the supernatural realm. And so now we are leaning now on powers that are outside of what we can do in the physical. We're now doing things in the, in this, in the spiritual or in the, in the that spirit realm. And it's no longer us that's doing it, but it's for him. And it's always for God's glory because we're doing the command that God told us to do. He told the Israelites, he told the disciples, you are going to do exactly what I did. So that's what we're doing. We're doing exactly what he did. We're sharing the faith. We're sharing God. We're, we're having conversations with people. We're, we're helping them see the light just like Jesus did. That's Yeah. We must walk in the spirit, be the witness that God wants us. And, and walking in the spirit means a supernatural life. And as you, you and I want supernatural encounters with God and with people. And for that to happen, the spirit has got to be in control of our life and, and, and given the go ahead to, you know, and, and, you know, the whole Pentecost, you know, they, I believe here they received the Holy Spirit here because when he's breathing on him, I believe that they were transformed right there. I believe that's what took place. But, you know, the question then was, well, what was the significance of the Pentecost? And, and again, this is going to be a whole show, and I think we need to do this show. Um, but that was, it was bringing the whole world together. That was the community. There was people from all parts of the world, all different tongues, all different nations, and that when they were waiting, they they then got the commission at that very moment. Boom, you're now ready. Here's your purpose. Here's where you're going to go. But that's a whole different show, show that we can talk about. But yeah. All right. Okay. John 20, 23 can be, a conf- can be a bit confusing to interpret. Yeah, says, read it. Yeah, it says Jesus. Oh, read, read the verse again. No, it's right here. I have it here. It's in there. You threw me off. Yeah. Sorry. All right. Jesus said to them, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. This must not be interpreted to mean that Jesus gave to a select body of people the right to forgive sins and let people in and let people into heaven, correct? He was not setting aside the disciples and their successors as the spiritual elite, uh, elite deal with the sins of the world. Right. I mean, think about it. I mean, th- listen to it. So if you forgive the sins of any, so he's talking to the disciples here, okay? If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. So it kind of sounds like he's given them the power to do. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, but is right that, is that our translation? No, or? no, no. That's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. So if you just if this is what we're sharing right now is if you just read this without researching this, because this is where this is a this is an example where our English doesn't do justice to the translation, to the interpretation, okay? So to read this right as it says, it, it does sound like that. It sounds like that. But here, here's the re- best way to understand it, is from the Greek text in the original, it says, and this is, this is kind of how it's spelled out in the original, okay? It says, whosoever sins you remit, that's the word, remit. So that word means forgive shall have already been forgiven them 
And whoever sins you retain, that word is retain, do not forgive. That's what it means, right? So let me just read it again. Whoever sins you forgive, this is the original, shall have already been forgiven them. And whoever sins you do not forgive shall have already not been forgiven them. So in other words, it's saying the disciples did not provide forgiveness. They proclaimed forgiveness on the basis of the message of the gospel. As the early believers went forth into the world, they announced the good news of salvation. If sinners would repent and believe in Jesus, their sins were forgiven. But if they denied Jesus, their sins were not forgiven. That we know, right? We all like, oh yeah, I know that. But when you read this, when you read it in the original, you're like, wait, what? So you have to understand it from the original. Yeah, if you just take this one, if you only, if you open up your Bible and you read this one verse, it, it really becomes confusing. It can be. But if you take it on the, the back of Jesus saying, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. But then there's this understanding that the authority has been given to represent the Father and the Father's word and to tell the message of the gospel that there is forgiveness in this. In knowing Jesus Christ, but but if you ignore this, there is no forgiveness. So you can speak what I have taught you as if it is the Word of God, and it is the Word of God, and you can represent me and tell people how to get forgiveness of sin. That's the way I take it. Yeah, and it, and I think it, let's again make it in context. So the context here is Jesus is talking about peace. Okay, so the context is listen, go to people. Tell them that they can have peace. They can have peace and, and their sins will be forgiven. And they can accept that. And I will give them peace. Or they can deny that and they will not forgive their sins and they will not have peace. That That's the context. And, and so for us, that's why it's the gospel of peace. That's why we know that. That's why they preached peace everywhere. Peace be with you, brother. Right? It's it's that was the that was the message. Jesus brought them peace. And he will bring the world peace if they believe in him and their sins will be forgiven. But if they deny him, they reject him, they reject this peace, their sins are not forgiven. So, yeah. Well, thanks for clearing that up, guys. Yeah. And we say this all the time. It's important to know the context. Yes. And <laughs> it's dangerous to just try to pull one verse out of the Bible and make yes. it. You can you can basically make it say anything you want. Yep. You can just search for one verse at a time. That's Con why, context I mean, is important. We encourage on, on this show so much that you we we'll always say, read the Bible. We always talk about that. Read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible. But now we're telling you, I mean, we've said this many times too, but it's important to not just read the Bible. You need to understand context. And, and so if you ever come across a verse like this, anytime in the word of God, you need to stop. Don't just not be know what the answer is. Don't just be confused by it. Stop, research it, open up a commentary, learn the context of where this is coming from, understand this, because it will definitely help your faith and it'll help encourage it. And here's the best part, three, 1 Peter 3.15, when it says that we have an answer, right? You want to be equipped. So if there is another believer that had a question with this and they were getting stuck on this, you want to have the answer to help them, teach them how to do this. Show them how to research this and understand this so that they too can be set free from this confusion. Mm. That's the reason why we have so many issues today is because people take things out of context and now they start getting all bent out of shape and these movements happen as false, false, you know, doctrine and everything else. And it's just like, holy cow, it's just because somebody did not take the time to actually learn it and research it. All right. Good stuff. Yeah. Well, I'm guessing by now the disciples' fear is starting to vanish. Yeah, I would think. <laughs> they were sure that Jesus was alive and that he was caring for them. They had both peace with God and the peace of God. Amen. They now had a commission on what they were supposed to do next. Carry on his message to the whole world. And that they had the power to tell the people their sins can be forgiven if they believe in Jesus. So, now that they have this confidence, let's read on John 20, verses 26 through 28. Okay. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again. And Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. 
Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe, mm. or yet have believed. Mm. Mm. Why was Thomas... Oh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, turn my page. Why was Thomas not with the other disciples when they met the evening on Resurrection Day? Was he so disappointed that he did not want to be with his friends? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, we don't know the answer. I mean, we, you know, this is eight days. Eight days, the disciples had this peace. Eight days, they had all of this knowledge, all of this wisdom. They knew things that were completely, their lives were transformed, right? They have the Holy Spirit. Thomas is on the outskirts. He doesn't have any of that. So there's eight days of silence for I've him. I've never thought about that before. And he's, yeah. and he's, and he's still... You know, he's still like, I, I'm never going to believe unless I see him and touch him. Right. Yeah. So I don't know. But Thomas was afraid. But in John 11, 16, it seems to indicate that he was a courageous man. Remember, he was willing to go to Judea and die with Jesus. And in John 14, 5, it reveals that Thomas was a spiritually minded man who wanted to know the truth and was not ashamed to ask the hard questions. But today, the, the church calls him doubting Thomas. But Jesus did not rebuke him for his doubts. He rebuked him for unbelief. He said, be not faithless, but believing. Doubt is often an intellectual problem. We want to believe, but the faith is overwhelmed by problems and questions. Unbelief is a moral problem. We simply will not believe. So the answer to your question is, is we, is we really, is he really cannot, we really cannot say what Thomas did. I mean, we don't know. We don't know why he wasn't We can there. speculate, but we really don't know. I just know that Jesus did not, by the goodness of God, he did the exact same thing. Here, touch. You know, let me, let, you know, let me bring you peace. Shalom. He did the exact same thing. He did the same thing. And when, and we're going to talk about this. It wasn't that his seeing is why he believed. And we're going to talk about that now. So it's the reason why he believed is what Jesus said. My Lord and my God. Right. All right. All right. So Thomas is a good warning to all of us not to miss meeting with God's people on the Lord's day. Because Thomas was not there. He missed seeing Jesus. He missed hearing his words of peace and receiving his commission and gift of the spirit of a spiritual life. He had to endure a week of fear and unbelief when he could have been experiencing joy and peace. Wow! Remember Thomas when <laughs> remember Thomas when you were tempted to stay home and not go to church. You never know the special blessing you might be missing. If that is if that doesn't preach, I don't know what else does. I mean, it's the the importance of being in fellowship every single week come on i mean having just perfect example we visited uh one uh an old church that we haven't been to in a long time right and and i was I had preconceived ideas but there was a reason behind it whatever but i went and i was just so blessed to be in the presence of god and to be around other believers and followers of christ and and it's it's like you can't miss. You just you gotta keep going. Whenever I travel, I always find a church. Mm. Everywhere I go, I always find a church. It's so important to be with the body of Christ. And here Thomas missed out on so much. You never know what God is going to say that week at church. Just go to church. But I agree with uh, what you're saying 100 percent um, Bob. Let's give Thomas a little credit for showing up the next week. Um, the other 10 men had told Thomas that they had seen Jesus' hands inside, so Thomas made that the test. He wanted proof, seeing is believing, right? But Thomas' words helped us to understand the difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt says, I cannot believe. There are too many problems. But unbelief says, I will not believe unless you give me the evidence I asked for. So Jesus dealt personally with Thomas and his unbelief. He granted Thomas' request and told him directly to stop becoming faithless, but become a believer. Jesus saw a dangerous process at the work in Thomas's heart, and he wanted to put a stop to it immediately. Mm. So thoughts, Barry, to that? Yeah. We we need to understand that doubt comes from a place, and and our enemy wants us to doubt, and, and he wants us to question things. And... Um, we got to know where those doubts come from. And, and uh, Jesus cared enough one man to prove and show himself to him. And that's, that's one of the things about this situation that moves me. You know, uh, I would have been right there. It, I can't say anything bad about Thomas. I would have been right there because I have, I would have believed that 
he's coming to be the king as they did. And I would have believed that I'm associated with the right guy. We're walking in Jerusalem and everybody's shouting Hosanna. And all of a sudden my best friend gets crucified mm -hmm. and I just, I, I'm just broken. Mm -hmm. And and then, you know, I, I don't want to be with these other guys because they're all, you know, feeling sorry for themselves. <laughs> I, I, I just, I just cannot believe my best friend is dead. And so we all handle grief in different ways. Yeah, that's a good point. And Thomas went off on his own doing yeah. whatever he had to do. And he definitely missed the service and he mm. definitely missed the miracle. Mm. But it is such a great thing that, that God knew that he said those words and that he wanted mm. to show him mm. his friend. Amen. And the closeness and intimacy of that. My God. Mm. Mm. Good. So John 20, 29 indicates that Thomas's testimony did not come from him touching Jesus, but from his seeing Jesus. He said, my Lord and my God. This is the last of the testimonies that John records to the deity of Jesus. Yeah, right? that's a good observation, basically from John. So John basically is concluding, you know, the deity of God at this very moment. So it's an encouragement to us to know that Jesus had, like you were just saying, Barry, had a personal interest and concern for doubting Thomas. He wanted to strengthen his faith and include him in the blessings that lay in store for his followers. Thomas reminds us that unbelief robs us of blessings and opportunities. It may sound sophisticated and intellectual to a question what Jesus did, but such questions are usually evidence of hard hearts, not of searching minds. Thomas represents a scientific approach to life, and it did not work. After all, when a skeptic says, I will not believe unless, he is already admitting that he does believe. He believes in the validity of the test of experiment that he has devised. If he can have faith in his own scientific approach, why can he not have faith in God that God has revealed to him? That's really good. All right, let's finish up the chapter. Verses 29 through 20, uh, 31 say this. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Mm. John could not end his book without bringing the resurrection miracle to his own readers. We must not look at Thomas and the other disciples and envy them as though the power of Christ's resurrection could ever be experienced in our lives today. That is why John wrote his gospel, so that people in every age could know that Jesus is God and that faith in him brings everlasting life. His point is that it is not necessary to see Jesus in order to yeah. believe. Yes, it was a blessing for the early church to know that he was alive, but that is not what saved them. They were saved not by seeing, but by believing. Yeah, it's, it's how many times I haven't seen any miracles. God never showed up, but God hasn't done any of these things. And, you know, how could I believe? Or he's, how could a good God do all these things? They have all of these questions to mm -hmm. make them just not unbelieve. But they never once stopped and just says, am I God or is he God? They never once stopped said that. And if he's God, then we need to align ourselves with him, not with him, with us, right? He's the one that sets the standards. He's the one that sets the bar. It's us that surrender our lives to him. That's and right. so I, I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes. It was Thomas demanding, you got to come to my, my understanding, right? If you don't come to me, then I can't, you know, I can't believe. Well, God, Jesus, this is the amazing thing. Barry, you just said this. It's amazing thing is that in spite of our stupidity, <laughs> in, in, in spite of us, God's grace and mercy is still available because he still goes through locked doors. He still does it today. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's mind boggling that you can be an atheist. You can be a skeptic. You can be this hardcore, whatever. And God in his loving grace and mercy will still go through that locked door of your heart. And he'll still show up and say, Hey, I am here. Amen. I'm still here. But we cannot, you and I, Bob, Barry, you and I, we cannot see Christ, nor can we see him perform the miracles that John wrote about in this book. Um, but the record is there. We, I wish I was there. Sometimes I said, man, you know, they ask that question, what would you, would you love to be, go back? Yeah, it would be cool to be in the presence of Jesus, right? It would be cool that to be one of his disciples, but we can't. 
the the record is there, but that that is all that we need, as Paul wrote in Romans ten seventeen. So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. As we have read John's record, we have come face to face with Jesus. We now know how he lived, what he said, and what he did. All of the evidence points to the conclusion that he is indeed God, come in the flesh, the Savior of the world. No way around that. You can read, if you read, that's why a lot of times people ask, what book should I read, you know, to start? Go read the book of John. Right. Because the book of John is going to set you straight. It's going to prove without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is who he says he is. But I don't know. Thoughts on that? Yeah, it's almost like John is an, an attorney here, and he just lays the case for 21 chapters, just lays the case for why Jesus is God. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. All right, one more. There's no need for John to describe every miracle that Jesus performed. In fact, he supposed that a complete record could never be written. Mm. The life and ministry of Jesus were simply too rich and too full for any writer, even an inspired one, to give a complete record. But a complete record is not necessary. All of the basic facts are here for us to read and consider for ourselves. There is uh, sufficient truth for any sinner to believe and to be saved. Amen. And and one of the things that I always associate with that is I believe that when you are a follower of Christ and you're walking intimately with you, the Holy Spirit is telling us all the things that Jesus said back then. He's revealing those things to us. It's like it's we don't have it written, but it's in concert with what is written. It's in, it's in context. It's, it's, I mean, God is sharing these little, like our next steps or where we're supposed to go or whatever that is, you know, you can't just write all of that down, but if you really evaluate what the Holy Spirit is telling you, it will always bring glory to God. It will always deny yourself. It will always elevate others. It will always be filled with kindness and love and joy. And if, if, if that is what you're experiencing and that is what is being revealed to your mind and your heart, so be it. Because that is the Spirit of God revealing the things of Christ. He's sharing with you what your truth is. He's sharing with you what you're supposed to do. So the subject of John's gospel is Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, period. That's what we know. He presented a threefold proof of this thesis, our Lord's work, our Lord's walk, and our Lord's words. In this gospel, you see Jesus performing miracles. You watch him living a perfect life in the midst of his enemies, and you hear him speaking words that nobody else could ever speak. Either Jesus is a madman, C.S. Lewis just said, or he was all that he claimed to be. But how could a madman accomplish what Jesus accomplished? When people trusted him, their lives were immediately transformed. This does not happen when you put your trust in a madman. He claimed to be God come in the flesh, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And I say to you, I believe that is what he is. Mm. So be it. Barry, talk to people that are on video. I concur. I believe as well, Pete and, and Bob. And if you're here today and, and you can relate to Downing Thomas and, and you just say, how, how can I believe? Well, Maybe you need to be rescued. Maybe you need for God to walk through the wall to you. And I'm telling you, he will. He will show up in your life if you'll open your life to him. And by faith, if you will trust him. And to trust him, there's three things you must do. You must admit that you are a sinner. That you do not measure up to the standard that is God's of being holy. And that you need help. That is the first place we start at. We start at asking God to forgive us of our sin. And then the evidence has been presented to you today that Jesus is the son of God, that he died on the cross to pay the penalty of our sin. But the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so we must believe in who he says he is. Just like this book says, of John says that I've written these things that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God. And you must believe that he died for you. You must believe he was buried and that he rose again on the, from the grave and that he is alive. And lastly, you must invite him to be your Lord, confess him as your savior. And if you would like to do that today, if you, if you can trust him today, 
and pray a prayer like this and invite him into your life, he will come and he will change your heart. He will change your life. He will give you faith. He will give you belief and he'll give you hope and forgiveness. And so would you consider praying this prayer? Dear God, I believe in you as a creator of all things. I believe that you love me. I believe that you want a relationship with me, but I come and I admit and I ask for your forgiveness. I have sinned against you. I have done things my way. I have lived my own life for my own self, and I'm sorry. And God, I believe in Jesus Christ, your son, God in the flesh. And I believe that he died for my sins. And I believe that he is the only way to heaven. I believe that he was buried and he rose again on the third day. And Jesus, because I believe that you are alive, I invite you to come into my life and reign and rule and live. Save me now. Be my Lord and Savior. Help me to live every day for you, and to tell others about you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. If uh, you said that prayer, we would love to hear from you. Um, the Bible says that all the angels in heaven are rejoicing with you right now. And uh, the Bible also then says, if you deny me before man, I too will deny you before my Father in heaven. But if you confess me before man, I too will confess you before my Father in heaven. So go ahead and share that with everybody. Go call your mom and your dad and your brothers and sisters and, and relatives and friends. Let them know that you gave your life to Jesus today. And then go log on to theriotpodcast.com. Go to the No God po uh, section get down there. Click that out. Let us know that you gave your life to the Lord. And we would love to get in contact with you and get you started in your walk and send you some things. But Bob, what, how else could they get a hold of us? Yeah, reach out to any of our social media uh, platforms. You can go to X, you can go to Facebook, you can go to YouTube. Make sure you click the subscribe button. Or what do they say? Smash the subscribe button. Yeah, smash it. Click the bell so you you, yeah. you get notified every time a new episode comes out. It sounds funny out. you said X. X. AKA I know. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to be, you know, yeah. like, cool, like, like, cool, like the kids, right? Yeah. But you know what? We're not done with the book of John yet. We still have a chapter to go. And one of my favorite chapters in yep. the entire Bible is yep. John 21. Yep. So make sure you listen next week or yeah, it'll probably be next week. Yeah. So um, God bless you guys. We're so happy that you decided to, to listen to us, join us today. I pray that God has spoke to you in just a, in a, an amazing and, and new and fresh way. What a, just an eye opening story, kind of putting ourselves in the room with the disciples as Jesus yeah. passes through the walls. Mm. Oh, it's crazy. Yep. Crazy good. It is crazy good. Have an amazing week of worship, guys. Be blessed. God bless you. This has been The Riot Podcast. If you liked what you heard today, please feel free to leave a comment and share it with your friends. See you back here next week for another episode of The Riot Podcast.